Hey guys, it's Shaylin, and I'm here today with another episode of Recent Reads. This is the series where I just chat about the last 10 books that I read, and a few people watch it, not many, but those of you who do, we have a nice fun time, chill fun time together. I write books based on a very unscientific combination of how much I enjoyed it and my assessment of the craft. I don't have a consistent scale or rubric that I write books on. It comes from the soul. And ultimately the numerical rating especially, it should always be taken with a grain of salt. None of these books were written uh, with the goal to cater specifically to me. When I critique a book, I really am just talking about my very personal assessment of it and my experience reading it. That's not to judge like the value of a book or what it could bring to someone else. I'm literally just talking about my own very subjective reading experience. I'm very behind on filming these videos. I'm literally gonna be talking about books that I read. I think back in December, I have my notes, but if my memory on what they're about is a little off, the book that I am the most excited to talk about, and I'm actually filming two of these back to back today, and of all 20 books I'm going to talk about today, this is the one I'm the most excited to talk about because it is one of my favorite books that I read in 2022. And it's All This Could Be Different by Sarah Thinkham Matthews. I adore this. You know when you read a book and from like the first page you know that it's going to be an all-time favorite? This was how I felt about this book. One of those books where from the first sentence to the last, it was utter perfection. <laughs> so this book follows Sneha. She graduates from university into a recession, but she gets a fancy job as some kind of consultant. Um, I forget, she has like, it's kind of an ongoing joke in the book that she has like a weird job title. Um, and she moves to Milwaukee. She decides as she's starting her kind of professional career, she's also going to start dating women. Very intrigued by this dancer she meets and we follow their relationship, we follow crucial friendships the, that she has. This was exquisite. The writing was exquisite. That's one reason why I knew from the very first page that this would be a favorite. I was immediately enamored and obsessed with the voice and the character on page one. That sounds great, I said, may have added. I'm honored to get to work with you. All nonsense. Once I hung up, I punched the air and yelled. I remember the restaurant as deserted, but it may not have been. This is not a story about work or precarity. I am trying late in the evening to say something about love, which for many of us is not separable from the other shit. As the summer began, I moved to Milwaukee, a rusted city where I had nobody, parents two oceans away. I lay on the sun-warmed floor of my paid-for apartment and decided I would be a slut. The voice is just so energetic deeply personal and gorgeous. There are lines in this book I still think about. This is just to me like the perfect millennial buildings Roman. It's so rare that a book can tackle so many topics and so many ideas while still feeling extremely close to its character and so cohesive in its execution. There is a like pu true pulse of life to the character and the voice that just feel completely wholly real. Every single thing that Sneha does or thinks is compelling. There will be scenes where she'll literally just be in a restaurant making internal commentary on the decor. And I'm like, I can't stop reading. <laughs> she can literally just describe a lamp in a restaurant and it feels true and it feels revolutionary and it feels insightful. I read 97 books in 2022, three of which are absolutely my favorites, and this is one of them. So then I read The World Cannot Give by Tara Isabel Burton. This book follows the protagonist Laura. She moves to an East Coast boarding school where I can't remember if it was the setting. I, I don't remember the exact details, but I think her favorite book was written there and is set there. I don't remember if it was set there, written there, or both. And she becomes very obsessed with this student named Virginia. Virginia kind of almost takes her on as her protege, and it's a little culty and stuff. Prose is like buttery, moody, really entertaining. The narrator, I think, is more naive than the story is. She's a very naive, innocent character, but as the reader, you're able to see around her innocence and able to get a more rounded view of what is happening than she is able to perceive. There was a familiarity to these dynamics. I did feel that I had read all these dynamics before. I felt that I had read the Virginia Laura dynamic before. Was I still engaged by it? Absolutely. It still did feel in some ways fresh and I was still engaged by it partly because the voice was so moody and entrancing. This did feel like your very classic dark academia with 
sapphic undertones. Well, they're not exactly undertones. They're partly also just overtones. I did feel I had read these character dynamics before, and I don't even read a ton of Dark Academia. This felt very classic Dark Academia in a way where I kind of could tell exactly where it was going, and the characters felt quite archetypal. It's quite a, a delicious voice to read. I did kind of just intuitively know where it was going at every turn because of the way the dynamics fit into these archetypes that felt so familiar to me. So then I read a poetry collection, Killing It by Gaia Rajan. My first note here, I said, there are some killer poems in here. <laughs> There's kind of this balance of poems that feel extremely punchy and others that just feel like they needed a little more work to like actually get to their what they were saying. Most of the poems do rely on the same imagery, which is obviously normal for a poetry collection, but in this case it kind of felt like they were all competing to do the same singular thing best rather than it being a range of poems that have the same cohesive threads of imagery. Does that make sense? There were a lot of poems that I felt like I was kind of just reading the same poems over and over, but for me the highlight is there are just like a few poems throughout. Um, I think I tabbed like five or six that really were excellent and poems that I know, and I know because like I remember reading one of them and was like I have to go hunt down her collection. Poems that I know if I read in a journal I would be wowed. The collection as a whole was just still a little unpolished. I would absolutely read a future collection from her because she does have a really fantastic voice. So then I read Avalon by Nils Zink. I was getting into my era of trying to read books that would give me some inspiration for my book that I'm drafting and I thought this would be a really good comp. So this book follows the young character Bran. Her mother joins a Buddhist colony and so then she ends up being raised by, I don't remember who it is exactly, her common law stepfather on a farm. I don't know, she meets a boy. I can't really tell you much about this. This book didn't leave much of an impression on me. I was ultimately pretty underwhelmed by it. It has also been a while since I read it. There was some really interesting detailing in the writing and a lot of witty moments in the writing. Ultimately, I just didn't feel the heart of any of the characters or any sort of urgency or cohesiveness to the story. I just wasn't really given enough reason to care. A lot of the elements happening here are things I'm really interested in. I mean, I picked this up as a potential comp to the novel I am writing, so it should appeal to me, but I just didn't feel a real heart or cohesion happening. It didn't really all fit together into a story that I was drawn into. I wish I could say more. It's been month, several months since I read this. So then I read The House of Rust by Khadija Abdallah Badjabur. This is such an interesting book. So the main character Aisha, I can't remember how old she is, maybe she's like 12? Her father is a fisherman and he goes missing and so she goes out to sea to find him on like a boat made of bones. There's a talking cat. This was just elegiac wondrous, mystical. The best way I can describe this is that it's like a children's story for adults. It taps into this wondrous sense of mysticism that I feel like I have not experienced since I was a kid reading middle grade. I did feel that sometimes this got a little lost in scene plot, like this, the scenes drifted too much away from Aisha, either in like distance of narrative voice or, you know, wandering off to too many other characters. And so it just became a little too murky to wade through her story, which was so engaging. But this is a very just utterly unique book. There's honestly nothing I can even compare it to. Like the closest I could think of would be Life of Pi. And that's just because it's about a kid in the ocean on a boat and there's a cat there. But the tone and execution and themes are completely different. This is just an incredibly unique book. It's so wondrous. So then I read the Tensorate series by Neon Yang, which I don't have because I lent it to my brother. This is a series of four novellas, which I did rank separately on my Goodreads, but I'm gonna just talk about all of them at once. I didn't actually read them all back to back. In the first two, we're introduced to these twins. One of the novellas following one of them, the second following the, the other, and then the story kind of morphs and evolves throughout the latter half of the series. This was a very accessible, fast-paced, but unique fantasy series. I've been looking for my perfect fantasy read and I felt like this ticked a lot of boxes for me and that it was fast and accessible to read. There was a lot of really interesting like queer themes baked into the world. The world building was quite interesting. So this is a series of four novellas. They almost function 
best as like a singular whole because the way that each novella builds off the previous novella is really compelling. The the last one was actually my favorite. It starts to play with form quite compellingly as you get later into the series. My favorite novella, which is The Ascent to Godhood, was easily my favorite because it had the most like intimate storytelling and voice, but it was also, it, despite being the most separate from the rest, but they're all quite easy to read, but still have like really rich world building. So I really, really enjoyed this series. This ticked a lot of boxes for me in terms of what I was looking for from a fantasy series. And if you want to get maybe back into reading fantasy, but something longer or denser is a little intimidating, this might be like the perfect place to look. So then I read Once There Were Wolves by Charlotte McConaughey. My brother bought this for me for Christmas because he said that it seemed like something that I would write. He was like, read the first page and tell me that that, and tell me that sounds like something you would write. Well, the book opens, when we were eight, dad cut me open from throat to stomach. In a forest in the wilds of British Columbia sat his workshop, dusty and reeking of blood. I was like, yeah, that does sound like something I would write, God damn it. There's quite a lot going on here. So we follow the protagonist, Inti, who goes with a research team to the Scottish Highlands to with a project to reintroduce wolves to the environment by like reintroducing an apex predator. It like kind of rebalances the environment. Inti comes from a very interesting background where, well, first of all, she has a form of syn synesthesia, which I don't remember exactly what it's called, but it's a very rare form of synesthesia, where basically anything she sees, she feels. So if she sees someone get a paper cut, she feels like she has gotten a paper cut. Everything she sees, she experiences. And she comes from this very interesting background where her mother lives in Australia and is a detective who researches like violent crimes. And so she has this extremely cynical, harsh view of humanity. Whereas her father is like a naturalist who lives in the woods, who has this very like symbiotic view of, of how the natural world fits together. And the writing was very engaging. There was a lot of really interesting stuff happening here with the wolves, you know, her parents, her synesthesia, she has her really traumatized sister with her. It also felt like there was so much going on that a lot of it doesn't really get the development that it needs. There's like a murder mystery that happens. There's a romance going on. There's a lot of plot elements. Later in the book, stuff starts happening super fast with like no time to breathe or develop what's going on, given that there's like so much happening. And so a lot of the plot points just start to feel dropped later in the book. And it starts to focus mostly on this murder investigation and her this romantic relationship and I, I probably found those the two least interesting elements of the book. They were the least original things going on. I could have read about this wolf project forever but anyways also at the end there were just like a few things that felt like weirdly pro-cop to me um, and I was like I'm not really vibing with that sentiment. So then I read Bad Creek by Jessica Johns. This book follows Mackenzie. She wakes up holding a pine bough, which she had had in her dream, and she starts having these nightmares and she starts bringing things from her nightmares back into her life. And this all starts to feel very connected to her sister who had died. She had left her family and moved to Vancouver kind of as a way to escape processing the grief. As these nightmares intensify, it forces her to truly face and process the death of her sister very like moody atmospheric dreamy dreamy book both literally and figuratively like it has a dreamy sense to it almost my year of rest and relaxation but like completely different but in that sense where the dreamy elements of the story bleed into the structure in a way that makes you feel like you are reading a dream and the dreaminess is also in very interesting contrast with this like deep realism of Mackenzie as a person and just like the daily lived in details of her life. Some really strikingly freaky imagery here. There's just like a sense of dread and like a chillingness that is like slowly building. But then it's in like beautiful contrast with like the warmth of the familial relationships. John's way of writing is both really crisp and quick while also being really vivid and personal. And so it just feels like a very well-balanced writing style that kind of gives you both like continuous motion and also like a fully drawn sensory experience. So then I read No Man's Land by John Vigna. This is a historical book set at like the turn of the 20th century in British Colum the British Columbia wilderness and there's this like growing religious faction led by this reverend and we follow the protagonist Davy whose you know group is kind of in opposition to him. The writing is so immersive, so moody very detailed eye here. The writing is like really such a detailed eye for describing the natural world. 
Um, but it also moves quickly and it's extremely immersive. Many of the scenes are super engaging. I, I did pick this up as a potential comp to my novel Honey Vinegar. It seemed setting wise. Like my book also is set in historical British Columbia wilderness with like 14 year old girls, the protagonist and growing religious fanaticism around her. So that seemed like a good comp. I think my main issue with this is that Davy, the protagonist is barely present for most of the book. We're almost never in her point of view. We never learn anything about her. She's kind of just there all the time and she like, she shows up, she's like, I'm here. We don't really learn a single thing about her. And so then the ending becomes like the ending of her story, right? And suddenly it's very focused on her and suddenly we're very deep in her story at like the 90% mark. The conclusion is kind of the conclusion to her narrative. And so it just felt like very out of nowhere for me. I don't know, I think I will be honest. I think this was a little too masculine for me, a little, which I probably should have gotten from this description. Haunting and bloody in the tradition of Cormac McCarthy and William Faulkner. But because the protagonist was like a teenage girl, I thought that I would enjoy that. But the thing is, she's not really the protagonist. I think she's branded as the protagonist, but she's not really the protagonist. She's just kind of there for like 80% of the story. And then at the last moment, we get the ending of her narrative. I would have loved this had we been fully immersed in her POV. I didn't really care about the other character. <laughs> So then I read another book that I'm actually really, really excited to talk about, Bad Fruit by Ella King. In this book, we follow Lily, who is the youngest daughter in her family, and she's about to graduate and go to university, and her mother is extremely toxic and overbearing, and her older siblings kind of make fun of Lily for basically being their mother's doll and just doing exactly what their mother wants, but her mom is such a toxic, emotionally controlling, but very emotionally unstable presence that this is kind of the only way that Lily knows how to fit into this family. She goes as far as to alter her appearance to look more like her mother. Her siblings kind of make fun of her for doing everything just to appease her mother and being completely under their mother's thumb, but that's really the only way that Lily knows how to relate to her family. But Lily starts to have these flashbacks that she doesn't know what they mean or where they're coming from that start to kind of reveal the truth to her about her mother's past and what her mother has told her about her past. I just thought this was a rivetingly intricate portrait of a family. How painful the process of peeling back layers of intergenerational abuse is, right? As, as Lily comes to accept the abuse that she has experienced from her mother, she also has to dive into the abuse that her mother experienced. And it's this weird reckoning for her to accept her own hurt that she has faced while also at the same time processing she's like she's processing her trauma from her mother's hands while also at the same time processing her mother's trauma i thought it was just very frank and searing in its exploration of that painful process i found the characters here were some of the most interesting characters i've ever read every single character in this family dynamic adds a really compelling but kind of weird dimension to this family it's just Every character fits into the story in a way that adds really interesting dimensions to what's going on. Her siblings, her fault, like everyone feels like a, another crucial, weird part of this deeply dysfunctional, toxic family. The relationship between Lily and her mother is one of the most compelling relationships that I have ever read in fiction. This is one that I've seen pretty mixed reviews on, but personally for me, the voice, the characters just hit a point of engagingness, realness, honesty, that really was quite striking to me. Um, it's not an easy read. Um, it is about like, f you know, familial abuse, but I thought that it was handled with such nuance and when you're so deep in Lily's point of view, she feels so real to you. So that's all for this episode of Recent Reads. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm gonna now go film another episode of Recent Reads because I am so behind on filming these videos. So thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you in another video. Bye.